One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process which starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. We all know that whales eat fish and krill, and some people, certain politicians in Japan, for instance, have argued that killing whales is good for human beings, as it boosts the food available for us to eat. And so you would think. But as the great whales declined, so did the numbers of fish and krill. It, it seems counterintuitive. Surely their numbers would rise as their major predators disappeared. But it now turns out that whales not only eat these animals, they also keep them alive. In fact, they help to sustain the entire living system of the ocean. Whales feed at depth in waters that are often pitch dark, and then they return to the surface, to the photic zone, where there's enough light for photosynthesis to happen. There they release what biologists call fecal plumes, vast outpourings of poo, poonamis. These plumes are rich in iron and nitrogen, nutrients which are often very scarce in the surface waters. And these nutrients fertilize the plant plankton that lives in the only place where plants can survive, the photic zone. Fertilizing the surface waters isn't the only thing the whales do. By plunging up and down through the water column, they also keep kicking the plankton back up into the photic zone, giving it more time to reproduce before it sinks into the abyss. Even today, though whale populations have been greatly reduced, the vertical mixing of water caused by movements of animals up and down through the column of the oceans is astonishingly roughly the same as the amount of mixing caused by all the world's wind and waves and tides. More plant plankton means more animal plankton on which the larger creatures then feed. In other words, more whales means more fish and krill. But the story doesn't end here because plant plankton not only feeds the animals of the sea, it also absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. When eventually it sinks to the ocean floor, it takes this carbon out of circulation, down to a place where it remains for thousands of years. The more whales there are, the more plankton there is. The more plankton there is, the more carbon is drawn out of the air. When whales were at their historical populations, before great numbers of them were killed, it seems that they might have been responsible for removing tens of millions of tons of carbon from the atmosphere every year. Whales change the climate. The return of the great whales, if they're allowed to recover, could be seen as a benign form of geoengineering. It could undo some of the damage we've done, both to the living systems of the sea and to the atmosphere. A video of a massive, unidentified sea creature was caught on tape by an oil rig cam. Well, we've identified it. So here are the facts and the reasons that make this creature so interesting. This is the 50 Strangest Animal series, picked by you guys. But first, I wanted to thank Arnold for sending us the footage of this crazy looking animal. Last year, the internet was abuzz when video recorded 5,200 feet below 
the surface of the ocean showed a strange, bag-like creature that seemed to investigate the man-made objects that infiltrated its territory. Was this proof of aliens, an unidentified sea monster, or just an extremely rare species of jellyfish? It was soon discovered to be Deepstaria reticulum. One of the things that gave away the identity of this mysterious creature were the testicles shown at the bottom of the creature in the video. The deep staria reticulum belongs to the jellyfish family Omeridae. This was the second deep staria species to be described. The first was the deep staria enigmatica, named after submersible deep star 400 when it was first observed intact during dive number 159 on October 22, 1966 by Dr. Eric G. Barham, Dr. George Pickwell, and Mr. Ronald Church. You'll often find these mysterious creatures in the meso- and bathypelagic environment. This large animal is quite fragile and very rare, and has only been observed in 29 dives in the last 20 years using submersibles of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. One of its closest relatives, determined through DNA studies, is the commonly seen Medusa, the moon jelly Aurelia aurita. It was described again in 1988 by Larson, Madden, and Harbison. Noting the two species display some unique behaviors in movement and pursing of the bell margin that are unknown in other medusae. They speculate that their feeding behavior of these medusae would be to hang vertically and motionless, leaving the large bell open for upward swimming prey to swim in accidentally. Upon contact, the umbrella would shut, trapping the prey whose attempts at escape would only cause it repeated stings until it weakened. Bagging prey in this way is not known in other medusae. Its bag-like body is covered in mesh patterns with no noticeable tentacles. The mesh-like pattern on its body is actually a network of connected canals which connect back to the stomach and using a branch digestive system it can distribute nutrients and energy through and across masses of jelly. The undulation of the jelly causes it to look like it's turning itself inside out. This is entirely because of the activities of the submersible's propellers which shoot water to propel it around. Its natural state